Welcome to the CEO Conversation. Uh, today we're honored to have Dr. Velma Traham with us, CEO of Thinkzilla. She's also author of the book, When God Says Go. She also leads what's called the Millionaire Mastermind that's specifically designed for women uh, CEOs. And so I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Dr. Velma Traham. So I'm delighted to have her with us on the CEO conversation today. Welcome, Dr. Velma. I get to call you doctor now. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. I'm honored and I'm actually excited to be here. Thank you for having me as your guest today. Well, you, it's our honor to have you today. I'm so impressed. You know, I've been a fan of yours uh, since we've met and, and learned about all the things that you uh, do. So I have a number of questions around, um, obviously, women leadership and women CEOs, um, around marketing, and of course, uh, your new book, uh, When God Says Go. So, hey, let's start with that book, because you just released it. And uh, I love the title, When God Says Go. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, why you wrote the book, and, and what are we supposed to do when God says go? Absolutely. So, um, and that's a great question. So I actually wrote the book in 2017, um, when God says go. Um, actually, I just re-released re the book um, since the pandemic because I wanted to do something where I could donate 100% of proceeds to women that have been impacted by this um, pandemic. Wow. Um, so I, I wrote the book when I actually left Houston. I'm, I'm from Houston. Um, and I went through a time in my life um, where I had to be still and I had to hear from God. And so although I didn't know what was going on, although I did not know um, what God was doing in my life, I was humble enough to know and to hear when God was telling me to go. So um, I moved from Houston to Atlanta and um, little did I know, I, you know, and I've just kind of been here and now everything has really unfolded. And um, so that's where when, when God says go have, um, it, you know, it came from me actually leaving my hometown, Houston, Texas, um, didn't know why. Um, a huge faith move. My family, everyone thought I was crazy. It's like, what are you going to do? Where are you going? God didn't tell you to go. What are you? I'm like, listen, I heard it. I heard it. So that's where when God says go. So it documents my journey and um, a lot of the steps that I had to take to overcome some of my darkest moments in my life. I, I love it. I love it. You know, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 46 10 that says, be still and know that I am God. And Amen. Uh, uh, so, but you know, it is hard at times when everybody around you is telling you, hey, that's not really God's voice or that seems crazy. How do, how do you overcome those times of doubt that you think, well, am I really on the crazy farm or is, or is it really God, God's voice? Because sometimes that's not always clear. Yeah, it's, it's not always clear. Um, but one of the, the, the most important things that we have to remember as believers, you have to stay in the word mm. and not only stay in the word, but you have to apply the word to your life. It's applicable. Everything is applicable. So I, I, I think about, you know, Noah, Noah started to build the ark before there was any rain. Mm. So when, when you, when you read those stories, when you read the book of Esther and when you read these books, you know, the stories, it's like, wow, these people had to take action before, you know, anything even happened. So um, not everyone is going to understand what God is telling you to do or your purpose in life. So I believe that when you're connected to God and when you apply the principles, when you fast, when you pray, when you really, really are intentional, of, you know, about having a relationship, you're able to hear clear. And so. Um, for me, I just decided that I was going to tune out everything and I was going to keep my focus on God because I, I wanted something that I'd never received in my life. I wanted a different life, a, a different life. And I realized that I had to get out of my own way in order to do that. Mm. Well, I like that. You know, one of the principles I write about in the book, Well Done, is believe and ask for the impossible. 
right? When, oh, wow. Right, the men, men say that it's poss impossible. God says it's possible. And, you know, having that idea of dreaming and visioning and thinking bigger than ourselves, you talked about just a second ago, you wanted something for yourself that, you know, you had never received before, right? Right. Um, many, many leaders doubt, we doubt ourselves. Uh, we sometimes are our are, are worst critic. And we sometimes walk in fear, you know, especially even like in the pandemic of losing everything. How did you get over that hump of saying, hey, I want something for myself that I'd never received before. I want to believe in the impossible. What, you, what was the steps you took? The fasting and praying and staying in God's word. Is there anything else that went with that? Well, I had to, I had to begin to remove myself from people mm. that, that was not on the same mission or was not headed in the same direction where I knew that God was taking me. And so with saying that, oftentimes it's, it's distractions that keep us from reaching our destination. So I began to understand the importance of discerning a distraction. Because sometimes you don't realize that you've been distracted until you're all the way in that could be a year that could be two years and so for me i'm very cognizant i said lord i need to be able to discern every distraction and so it began to you know it was very clear of how this habit or how the daily habits not your intentions determines your destination mm. so if my daily habits were not productive, then I knew that it was ultimately going to end up with me being distracted. So that was the most important thing for me is really, really being able to discern distractions and to be very clear and stable minded in the process. Hmm. Is that part of what, one of the things that I love that you do is the millionaire mastermind. And uh, it's really focused on uh, women entrepreneurs and helping them to believe the impossible, believe that they can create a business and, and to have this network of people around them that can help them to believe something. Is that, is that part of where that Millionaire Mastermind came from? And can you tell a little bit about the Millionaire Mastermind story? Yes, absolutely. So that is where the Millionaire Mastermind came from. But one of the things that I realized, um, Ken, um, early on in my entrepreneur journey, I had to figure out a lot of things on my own. I had to, what I like to say, I had to fail forward fast before I could reach the destiny. Before I could become successful, I had to fail a number of times. Mm. And they don't teach us in school to get mentors, right? And, you know, I, I just had to go through a lot of things to get where I am today. But one of the problems that I wanted to solve I wanted to be the person that was able to help other people to minimize their risk in entrepreneurship and also by doing so, utilizing the principles in the Bible or understanding how important it was to keep God at the forefront of every single thing that we do. So I started the Millionaire Mastermind um, without even knowing that it was going to ultimately end up to, I'm sorry, become a nonprofit organization. So the mission of the nonprofit of Millionaire Mastermind Academy is to empower women to rise above poverty through entrepreneurship, through entrepreneurship. So um, over the past three years, um, I have been able to mentor and um, coach over 4,000 women. Um, that have actually um, attended our monthly um, economic empowerment events in Atlanta. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have really, have really embraced the, the academy and the initiative. Um, I've created an entrepreneur um, curriculum to help um, women that are transitioning from corporate into um, the entrepreneur space. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding and also spirit led 
Um, so that's where the Millionaire Mastermind Academy um, comes from. I believe that it, it starts with the mindset. And the Bible tells us that for our people perish for a lack of knowledge. And we, we have to have the right knowledge in order to be fruitful and successful. I love it. I love it. So can you just unpack a little bit more about what um, happens at the Millionaire Mastermind and then uh, the follow up? So, um, you know, you bring usually it's about 100 women together for that mastermind, uh, what I understand. And you spend the day together. You've got some speakers that come in. You give a presentation. It's really based a lot in scripture. Uh, were you talking about these biblical principles? Can you tell a little bit more about what happens there? Yes, absolutely. So um, the Millionaire Mastermind Experience, um, it's a two-hour um, initiative that we have every month. And they've grown from, you know, having 100 attendees to, to now two, 300. I think our last one in before the pandemic, uh, February? Yeah, February. Um, we had about 300 women and that was like awesome. Um, so we have a, of course we pray. We started, we start off in prayer because I, I believe again, that God should be at the forefront of everything. If it wasn't for God, I would not be here. So we have to definitely honor, honor, honor the Lord. Um, and so we start off in prayer. Um, you know, we, we, we share some entrepreneur principles. Um, we share some scriptures, um, we have testimonial time where the ladies share their testimonial, their testimonies. Um, we do a Q&A and then we have a live fireside chat with um, a business leader. Um, and, and so it's just a very, very um, candid conversation, you know, that, that really uh, unlock the key, the answers to some of the, the challenges that women go through. Oftentimes, we, we, we don't know how to, well, I found that a lot of people don't know how to articulate what it is that they're feeling. They know that it's something, but if you don't know what you don't know, then you don't even know that you're not really progressing in life. So because I've already been there, I know the right questions to ask. And so it's, 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 it's you know, that's kind of the format of it. So uh, we like to call it and you know, call it an experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. You know, I think self, uh, I always say that self-awareness always precedes self-improvement, right? And part of that self-awareness comes from the people that we associate with. I can't sometimes see all my blind spots. I, I don't know why I'm always hitting, hitting that wall at times. And sometimes having a mentor or somebody outside that's been there or that's failed, like you talked about, failed fast, failed often, they can say, hey, you know, I experienced that. Here's what I did to get around that wall or over it. Um, so that whole idea of um, the mentorship and the wisdom of others is, I think, real critical to our success. Uh, I say Jesus never let alone, and no great leader ever was by themselves or was ever alone. Um, can you talk about, I mean, you talked about failure, and you talked about a candid conversation uh, you've had some difficulties that you've had to overcome in your life. Every leader does. How did you overcome failure? How did you pick yourself back up and get started? And what do you encourage when you have those candy conversations with uh, uh, women CEOs specifically that are dealing with diff setbacks or failures? How do you encourage them to get over that? Yes. Um, I, I, one of the things that I, that I always, you know, remind people is that we have to become the change that we want to see. Mm. We have to become the solution to the problem. So oftentimes when people are looking to go into business and they're looking to do anything in life, the first thing they say is, oh, well, I'm going to do this because of how much money I can make. That is not the reason that you should do anything. Dominion is not a pursuit. Mm. Dominion is the result of something. So in order to get to the result of something, you have to be able to know what your purpose is in life. You have to understand what your why is. So 
when you under when you understand what your why is in those challenging times that you want to give up or when you don't feel empowered it will allow you to reflect back to the reason you started in the very beginning and so your why have to be greater than your fear the why have to be something that you you have to do it's a desire it's 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 a desire it's a burning desire to accomplish the thing that god have placed you on earth to fulfill so when i would get down when i would get discouraged i would say you know what it's not going to be easy the bible tells me for i know the plans that i have for you those plans are to prosper you and not to harm you and so i i recite those scriptures in like the scriptures in my mind and every time i get down it's like okay then i get on my knees and i pray and then it just feels like there is something that just resurrected on the inside of me and guess what i'm back at it again mm. Oh, I love it. You know, I love that verse. Um, I'll tell you a real quick personal story. I don't think I've shared with you yet, Velma, but, um, you know, when my youngest son, Kaiston, was born, he's our, our fourth child, and um, we just prayed, prayed over the pregnancy. Uh, we just thought he was, God had brought him for a special reason. And long story short, when he was about 13 months, 14 months, he lost all ability to communicate. Mm. And uh, he was later diagnosed with a uh, uh, a diagnosis of what's called apraxia. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it at the time, but basically it's a, something that happens where it uh, impacts the ability to communicate and actually how his body moves and so on and so forth. So wow. long story short, um, one of the things that I do for each of our children uh, is I give them a life verse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so usually it's when we're at the hospital, you know, as I'm praying, you know, I'm not doing anything while my wife's delivering. So <laughs> I, might, I, might, I might as well pray, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be in the room all that. But, uh, you know, I ask God to give me a verse for their life as they're being born. And Amen. Uh, for our youngest son, that Jeremiah passage was his life verse. That I know the plan wow. for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I thought, well, that's a good verse. I, that's a very familiar verse and but god if this is the verse for kaiston then his Amen. name is kaiston, right? so when he couldn't talk um you know i went back to that purpose just back to that why like you were talking about i said god i know the plans you have for him they're plans to prosper him and every night i'd pray over his bed and you know god back to this idea of believing and asking the impossible right that uh god kind of convicted me during that time because we would had many doctors tell us that he would never talk and wow. I said, you know, uh, God, there's mute. I did a whole year study. This is a whole another thing, but I did a whole year study on muteness in the Bible. People that couldn't talk, times that we were silent. And, you know, the Bible was filled with talking about that be still like we started, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, stories in the Bible where uh, either God took a voice away uh, for a period of time or had people walk in silence for different reasons. And it just opened up my mind. But I also saw that God had the power to overcome that silence. And so, Amen. you know, my prayer for, for Kyston wasn't that God would give him the ability to speak. I thought that was too small. Uh, and so since I, God had plans for him, back to the purpose, I said, God, why don't you grow him up to become a preacher that he could speak to pe thousands of people in a multitude of languages? <laughs> and uh, oh, wow. so we prayed that prayer over God's, uh, and you know, dealing with a, a child, and I, some of the people probably in our call today, uh, you know, we have children with, uh, I call them super abilities, not disabilities, but uh, you know, it's it's a struggle. You know, it was a struggle trying to understand Kaiston when he couldn't talk. It was a struggle mm -hmm. every day seeing him different than every other child, and even our own children that we had raised before. And those are failures in some ways. It feel, mm. felt like a failure. And mm. it just had to be called back to that purpose. And, you know, Kaiston, here's the Stin story. He's now nine years old. He's now speaking two different languages. He wow! Now, he uh, speaks English and Spanish. He, he, spe he understands four languages, uh, which is a pretty amazing thing. And he actually under started understanding language before he could ever communicate. But it was a it was an amazing thing that God's do. So I have no doubt in my mind that he is going to be a preacher someday. 
that will preach to thousands of people in a multitude of languages. But it, it, I tell you that story because it ties right into what you're saying about in business, you know, we got to have that ultimate vision of what we're trying to accomplish. What is God? What's God's purpose that he's called us to? Because days are tough, right? It is hard at times. We're going to have setback, but we got to dust ourselves off and say, hey, God, with your help, I can accomplish this goal and this purpose. And not only can I accomplish it, I must accomplish it, right? Um, so, hey, uh, I know that you've had some goals in your life, and one of those goals were uh, was around your education. You just became a Dr. Velma Traham, and so congratulations on your doctorate. Can you can you tell? I mean, you obviously are so wise and smart, and you, but tell me about your personal growth story and why did you decide you wanted to go get your doctorate? Yeah, so. You know, it's interesting that you that you asked that question because I've I've always um been the type of person that wasn't really about titles, right? Um, you know, because you know, I believe many are called but only a few are chosen. Mm -hmm. So I've again, I've never really been about the titles, but when I moved to um Atlanta, um there was the the vice president of a Christian academy, higher place Christian University here in Atlanta. It's a leading um, accredited um, Christian um, university here. And she had been coming to the mastermind for quite some time. And she said, Velma, um, you know, I think you would be interested in our, in our program. And, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I got a lot of stuff going on. I'm really busy. I don't really care a whole lot about titles, this, that, or the other. And so um, one day I was praying and I said, you know what? let me check it out. So, you know, I started, you know, I started going and, you know, I went through the, um, you know, the, the program, it was, it was pretty lengthy and, you know, and, and I came out victorious. So it's, you know, a doctorate in um, Christian business and leadership. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, I think it speaks to your vision of self-improvement and you're continually wanting to grow. And I say, Hey, uh, leaders have to continue to want to improve, right? We That's can't right. We can't lead from yesterday. We've got to lead for tomorrow. Um, you know, I think this pandemic is a time of that where, you know, the new normal of business, um, we've got to learn to adjust and pivot. You've had to make some adjustments and pivots in your life. Uh, obviously, you talked about the move, but even in your, your company, Thinkzilla, um, as you continue to grow, you help companies think about uh, branding and marketing and and how do they adjust in, to that new normal? Can you give us some insights on how do we continue to grow? How do we continue to adjust either as leaders or, or as a company? Absolutely. Um, you know, Ken, that's, that's a really, really great question. Um, innovation is key right now, okay? The traditional way of doing business, it's, it's out of the window. A lot of people are thinking that it's going to get back to normal it's not going back to the norm, okay? It is a new norm. We're in a digital space, you know, digital currency, digital marketing, technology. So technology is key and in being innovative, creating new things, solving problems. So whatever it is, you know, that you're doing, you have to adapt to what, what are the problems that need to be solved and then you have to move fast. You cannot be afraid to pivot. You have to, you know, have the right team. You have to innovate. You have to be able to use technology. A lot of people are not technology savvy. And if you're not technology savvy, you want to bring on someone or a team of people that can help you with your messaging. You still have a product and or services that, um, that has value and that people are looking for. So you have to, you know, know how to, position and this is what we do at um thinkzilla we're actually um getting ready to pivot um and and to another company called awkward genius and we're going to be helping private and public organizations and companies connect to communities mm. um so i'm really excited so we're going to be using marketing technology um virtual public relations strategies and all of our contacts to be able to merge the private and public to our communities, to the people who need the resources. So oftentimes, you know, when you're 
um, you know, kind of high up in organization, you don't know how to communicate to people. So you always hear people say, well, you know, I'm, I really want to help, but I don't know where to start. Or maybe you bring on a lot of people who still, who don't know how to engage the community. And so, because that's how I started in grassroots. So now I'm able to now be that conduit to help these organizations improve our communities, which ultimately will help us to end poverty. Oh, I love it. I love it. Awkward genius, huh? Yeah. Where did you, where did you come up with that? I like that name. That's uh that's very unique. Yeah. So my fiance and I, we were talking and, um, you know, he said, you know, cause he's, he's very, very creative. And he said, you know, um, they just got to accept it. We're just awkward genius. I said, he said, I said, what did you just say? He said, we're just awkward genius. I said, wow. He said, you know what? That's the name of the company right there. And I, I started to pray about it. And I'm like, wow, that is an amazing name. Like I can see that on billboards. I can see that, you know, and it, and it speaks to the new norm. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it came from. I love it. I love it. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, I think every person, any business person and most probably any person can uh, relate to that name. I think that's fantastic. You talk about branding message and communication, and then we'll, we'll talk about communities in a second. But, you know, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of businesses make and business owners is they don't think through their brand message or how they're communicating in the marketplace. Um, what do you do to encourage companies to think through how do they communicate to, to make a difference or to, you know, show the value that they bring as a, as a company or as an organization? Uh-huh. The first thing I can is understanding who your target audience is. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're creating messaging that does not have a target audience and you don't know, or you don't know who your target audience to, it's kind of like throwing paint on the wall. So number one, we want to identify who the target audience is. Mm -hmm. um, number two, we want to, identify what makes the audience tick what what are they reading what are they watching you know how do they think you know what do they want to hear you know what are their behavior patterns um so we encourage them to think about those type of things and we actually do that through a lot of um you know artificial intelligence you know through research through data and understanding you know how to target the right messaging um, so messaging is, is very, very, very important. Um, not only is messaging important, but having a strong call to action. A lot of people have websites that has a lot of content, but you're not, you're not very, people are not clear as to what action do you want them to take. So you have a lot of different things on the website, but you don't, a person don't know what do you want them to do. So being able to identify what the call to action is so that you can get the desired outcome for the visitors on your, that, that, you know, go to your site or go to any of your um, collateral. Um, last but not least, consistency and brand continuity is important. You know, um, telling the story. People are no longer just buying something. They want to know what's the story behind it. So making sure that you incorporate storytelling in your messaging and in your strategy. And, and, and that's, that's what we have really, really thrived in, you know, understanding the unique value proposition in our clients. What differentiates you from this, this you know, your competitor? You know, what, what messaging, what's the story that we need to tell? What, what are the key points that we need to touch? What are the media messaging that we need to do? What media outlets do we need to reach out to to help to tell this story? So um, that's that's what we that's what we do. Um, but those are the points that I would I would definitely you know recommend those those key points. Yeah, a question that we had. Speaking of the marketing piece, and you mentioned the call to action. Actually, a question that I got from a CEO was. Um, what are some good call to actions that we should have on our website? Yeah. What have so, you seen as a good, as a good model for that? Mm -hmm. um, one, a downloadable piece of content that you can continue to engage. Um, number two is call today. 
or contact us now. I'm creating a sense of urgency in your call to action. Um, take action today and, and being very, very clear as to if a person don't take action, what could they be, you know, what could they be missing out on? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, the time that they could be losing by not taking the immediate, the immediate action. So, um, so those are, those, those are some of the um, call to, um, call to actions that I recommend, but um, you definitely want to um, continue an ongoing communication um, with people. You know, uh, again, people do not like to be um, sold. You know, you can, people don't want to just feel like, you know, they're being sold consistently. So educate them, educate them, inspire them, and then they'll become lifelong customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the, you know, we talk about the golden rule works if you work it, right? And, and I think when it comes to a call, call to action, thinking through something that we're adding value to somebody else. If somebody comes to my website, what would I like to receive if I came to the website, uh, whether it's a, a, a tool, um, whether it's a, um, so a downloadable content, something that gives real value right away to a, a, a new customer or a new relationship that uh, then we can continue the conversation to add even potential more value. So I like, uh, I like what you're thinking around that uh, uh, call to action piece. And I see that a lot of companies make that mistake where, you know, they put a lot of money in a website. They do a lot of, it looks beautiful. It, you know, it's nice uh, brand touch, but there's no call to action. There's no relationship uh, piece, right? Um, so I think that's real important. You know, Jesus uh, was a real master about that. He he would always have these conversations where he'd expect people to do something. You know, even Zacchaeus is a good example of that. He says, hey, let's go to your house today, right? Or Peter was, come follow me, right? There, These were call to actions. It wasn't just let's have a conversation. Even with the women or people that was brought to him in sin, a woman caught in adultery, he says, go and sin no more. That was a there was a call to action. There was something because of the engagement that they had, he wanted them to take the next step of the journey. And I think as business owners, we could look at that. I mean, it's obviously it's different, but look at that same uh, perspective. Hey, um, one of the questions that I got, and you know our heart at CEO Experience too, is for um, obviously for Christian CEOs, we have a number of women uh, Christian CEOs that meet together in some of our retreat days and, and uh, using um, the biblical bu business principles. I know your heart is for women leaders and women uh, Christian CEOs. So one of the questions that we received was, what would you say to a woman uh, uh, CEO today uh, about how, does, how do they manage life and, and work and, and, and being tenacious? And do they have to become like men or can they be fully women uh, women and be a good ceo how would you answer that question um that's a good one educated on that than i am so uh, you could, you could. That, that that is a good one so we as christian women we have to remain submissive under submission Wow, I'm like I'm taking notes on that. Wow, that's a good. <laughs> go ahead. I like the, I like the, go ahead. <laughs> so for me, it's definitely a balance. You, you you have to you have to really really um you have to balance. You need your personal time, and you you need the time. You know you need your business time. But for me, ministry is a lifestyle. Ministry is a part of my life. So I don't turn ministry on and off. I am who I am. I love the Lord. That's going to be the forefront of everything that I do. And God has got to be the forefront of everything that you do. And when you truly pray and seek things, God is going to give that to you. And do not worry about tomorrow. Live in fullness in today. Be anxious for nothing but be prayerful about every single thing. And so when you wake up in the morning, you say, you know what? I'm here. I'm here to stay. I'm at it. And that's just what it is. So I take things day by day. I plan accordingly. 
ministry is a lifestyle and I make sure that I carve out time for my personal, the, the personal time that I need to re, uh, to rejuvenate, to rejuvenate and to really, really restore my mind. Mm. You're, you're talking about, um, I, I love your thoughts, uh, Velma. You, you were referencing submissiveness, uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that you were referring to uh, your home life and your uh, husband or your boyfriend being the head of the relationship to some degree. Um, of course, obviously, our submissiveness to God. You know, uh, my wife, who I think the world of, I, I say she's one of the greatest leaders that I know. She's a strong visionary leader. Um, she leads uh, in, uh, obviously, in the marketplace in the world. Um, and she's, we've talked a lot about that concept of sub submissiveness. And, you know, I appreciate that she has that heart of submissiveness when, when at, at our home. But, you know, she's actually inspired me to be a better leader uh, as she, it's one of those funny things about, you know, and Ephesians tells us that we should submit to one another even. But as mm -hmm. I learned submissiveness, or as she's taught me submissiveness at times, whether it's submissiveness to God or, or learning how to, to uh, understand how to let go of things that mm -hmm. I'm not in control of, right, which really is a component of submissive, submissiveness, we actually become stronger leaders, I believe. And uh, Amen. that's one of the, it's a, it's a weird paradox, but yet so many people struggle with submissiveness and they say, hey, I don't want to be, I want to be a leader, but so I, I call it followership to some degree. I said, every great leader should become great followers. You know, Jesus called followers first. And, right. uh, you know, even in this pandemic, I think there's a component of followership, right? That there's yeah. things out of my control and God's, right. God's not asking me to control things that I can't control. He's asking me to control things that are inside. Real quick, I had another question uh, from a woman leader, um, and it kind of ties to this idea, so I was curious to get your thoughts on it, is, uh, and it may reference some of the submissiveness, you know, in the marketplace and as the owner of your company, everybody's looking to you, you know, you're leading, you are got the vision, you're out in front, and then you come home at times, and, and you have to put on a different hat um, being submissive. Do you find... I, I loved your comment where you said you're kind of who you are everywhere you are. But um, sometimes I think women have a, a difficult time, and, and I think all of us do as leaders, but turning it off at times and becoming something different in different dynamics. So do you become a different person in submissiveness or are you still who you are? You just recognize that this is a place that I don't have to necessarily control everything. Yeah, um, definitely. I've, I've, I've come to the realization um, that God is ultimately in control. Mm -hmm. um, and with that being said, you know, we're still under the authority of God. So I am a woman that is submissive, but I'm under the authority of God. Mm -hmm. And so in saying that, we have to lead with the characteristics of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that has really, really allowed me to um, see things from a different viewpoint. We're not ultimately in control, but when you lead, when you, when you lead the right way, when you identify other leaders that you can duplicate yourself and put the right systems in place. And that was a question that someone just asked, how do I uh, balance multiple businesses? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to create systems and a system is a repeatable process that works over and over that produces results. So you put the right people in place, you, you lead the right team, you empower them, you inspire them and, and document everything. We, we have to, you have to uh, learn how to document things so that you don't become an employee in your business, but you are actually a business owner by putting the right systems and having the right leadership in place. Mm, that's good. Yeah, that was uh, Dr. Danielle Davis. Danielle, I'll take you off a uh, mute. So I've got the two doctors uh, talking to each other. <laughs> Now, what a uh, this is getting high class here. Wait just a second. Hey, Daniel, do you have a, a further follow up comment about uh, managing multiple businesses? Actually, that wasn't my comment, but I'm definitely oh, grateful. Yeah, <laughs> I'm grateful for the opportunity. 
Um, but I mean, ultimately that question is um, quite relevant. And I literally just finished creating our strategic plan for one of our programs because I can't continue to work in it. I have to now over, have the oversight of it. And so we literally finished the manuals for the events, everything. So I, I agree. Um, but I would probably yield to our other sister so that she can chip in on this conversation. Hey, hey Tracy, let me go ahead and a, uh, ask you to comment on, um, you had another question as well about the quarantine um, uh, point of it. And so, um, let me see if I can get you off unmute. Maybe you can unmute yourself and uh, ask that question. Unmute. Okay, sorry. There's a uh, two buttons you have to push on this end for unmuting. <laughs> so, um, well, it, it's the, the reason why I asked the question is I, I fully relate. You know, especially with all the things that you do, any given day, any one of them, all of them are priority one. And so my, my follow-up question to that is, has being in quarantine changed anything for you that from what it was before we went in? You know, because it's changed so many dynamics in, in many respects, but has it changed, like when we come out, does any one of the many things that you're doing, you know, take priority as a transition point um, as you, you know, just get to whatever that next season is that God has for you? Hopefully it makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. That's a, that's a really, um, really great question. Um, so there, there has been some things that I've kind of put to the back burner um, because I believe that timing is everything. And so as things change in the world, you have to move at a rapid pace in order to keep up. Um, but, you know, honestly, for me, it, it's things have just picked up so fast so i've been hiring more people i've been bringing you know so things are coming together so to answer your question um i've you know really had to be an intentional prayer about what's important for this season what's important for this season because just because you have all of these things happening it doesn't i mean going on or are things you know that's in alignment with your purpose doesn't necessarily mean it's for right now sometimes we got to know when to put it on the back burner when to pivot so that we can focus on what God wants us to do right now in this season. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I, you know, I teach the idea of knowing your order, working your order as well. Right. And, you know, Jesus had a good clarity around in this season, here was the order of things. And right. I think that's just so critical for us as business owners, because there's so many, I, I call leaders diamonds, right? Because mm. we have so many dimensions that we look at. And a lot of times we're going after, you know, we might have five or six different areas of our business that we see as all critical, but you can't do five or six things at one time. You have to pick the order right. and say, here's the things that are most important. Hey, uh, we've got just a few more minutes with uh, uh, Dr. Velma uh, Traham. If you've got a question on marketing, um, uh, uh, public relations, brand messaging, uh, go ahead and send those questions either through the chat box or send them directly to me or, or text. Um, one of the questions that I, I received, Velma, that I thought was real important that I wanted to ask you about is, you know, with the shutdown and, and this change in business, the idea of human relationships would become or knowing the customer and what the customer's expectations might be as we come out of this through recovery. How do you stay close to the customer? What best advice? And you talked about earlier, you know, a lot of research around it. Um, is, is for small businesses that may not have big budgets, how do they hear the voice of the customer? What, what best ideas do you have uh, related to building that brand message? Yeah, so right now, everyone has their phone in their hand. Mm -hmm. You have to use technology. You have to use your social media channels to communicate. A lot of people, you know, don't like doing videos. I say, look, if you can have a conversation with someone, just just look at it, look at it as though you're talking to one person mm -hmm. and talk, communicate, be authentic. You don't always need to have a script. Everything life isn't about a script. People want to know who you are. 
So my team always, they, they always get on me because when I have interviews or anything like that, it's like, Velma, we need to write a script. I'm like, no, we're not writing scripts, okay? I'm going to talk about whatever the Lord or the Holy Spirit downloads in my mind. So no script. So people want to see an authentic person. They want to know, you know, so I think now is the best time to embrace technology and to let people know how grateful you are for them. A lot of us, we, we don't tell people, thank you. Look, I was just, you know, I was on live yesterday on Instagram and I said, you know, I want to thank all 91,000 of my Instagram followers. I appreciate y'all, you know, and so people want to know that you, you care, first of all. So you, you, they want to know that they, you care so that they can know that they can trust you and then they can like you and they want to know that you are really, really there for them. So, um, and, and share again technology is is key right now uh, making sure that you're capturing email addresses or something so that you can stay in constant communication and it's not like you know you have to sit up and send something out every day well with technology if you wanted to write out or have a company write out 10 blogs and, and have it scheduled out every day or every week then you can use technology to pre-schedule things so um, just staying in constant just staying in constant communication mm. with them, letting people know that you care. You just you just hit a nerve. I got a couple of quick questions. Uh, sure. Them privately to me. So one was uh, you talked about Instagram. Uh, is there a better social media platform versus another? Was one of the questions. Go ahead and answer that question first. I'll ask you the next one. I'm sorry, Ken. So my fiance is right here, and <laughs> and and um. You know, their org I'm sorry, their organization was just um someone just donated, a senator donated a million dollars to their nonprofit organization. So they've been feeding fourteen hundred families a day on the front wow. line. Well done, well done. I love it. I, I, I will Hello. Hello. <laughs> hey Kurt, keep well, up. Father Kurt. Let me get you Okay, I'm sorry, Ken. I just no, want to say, you're good. I like it. Authentic conversation. <laughs> yeah, authentic conversation. Oh, That's yeah, right. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> hey, people are attracted to authenticity. I love it. You know, some of us still have a problem getting on videos uh, because you know maybe we're concerned of how how we look and all those things. But you know, it, it, it's how God made us, right? And so we like right. the technology that God's given to us. One of the questions real quick, though, you mentioned Instagram, um, and the question was, is there a better social media platform than another? Or is there one that you recommend? Um, it all depends on um, what you are looking for. It all depends. Um, so Instagram is a really, really great platform to post pictures. Um, if you're a picture person, post pictures. LinkedIn is a really, really great platform to share lots of content because you have, um, you know, more of your leaders, your CEOs, your your decision makers on LinkedIn. And then Facebook is more so family um, oriented, so ads and things of that sort. So it all depends. I like to use all of them. Mm -hmm. Well, another question we had was, you mentioned you had pretty large following. How do you start to get a following on a social media platform was the question that I got. You know, I, I started to grow my following just by adding value, giving as much value as I, as I possibly can, and being the voice of hope. Mm -hmm. Because so many people are in a dark place right now. So if you can actually, you know, make people smile and make people hopeful, they will become a follower. Mm, that's good. So did you do a lot of videos or how did you do that? The first. Just what's, what's interesting is I hate videos, okay? <laughs> So this has actually been a new thing for me. I don't like videos, but so I'm just, uh, you know, posting lots of pictures and lots of content. Mm. But what, what did, what have really helped is when I'm actually doing events and things like that, my media team is always, you know, getting video. They're always getting coverage. They're always getting footage. They're always getting, you know, things like that. So that helps because then they push it out. And then other people that hear me speak, they're recording and they push it out. So then their followers start to follow me. Mm -hmm. That's good. Hey, another quick question. And we've just got a couple more minutes. Dr. Okay. Um, you talked about authentic and I believe that's actually one of the benefits right now is we're getting to see a lot more authenticity. One of the questions I received though was, 
can we be too authentic or is there a level? Sometimes I don't want to, the question is, I don't want to share everything that's going on in my world. So how do you decide what to share versus not what not to share? Yeah, um, you definitely have to use wisdom. Um, wisdom is very, very, very important. And honestly, you know, not everything is, is meant to be shared. Um, and, and with saying that, you know, again, we, we, we really just have to, we really just have to pray. Some things, you know, aren't meant to, to be shared and, and, you know, some things are. And so, you know, I just look at, you know, how, how does my situation, how is it relatable to people right now? And how can anything that I go through help anyone else? And so that's what you have to keep in mind. If you went through an experience that's hurtful to you, then obviously you don't want them to share that because there is enough hurt already out there. So you want to share things that will inspire and tell stories that will help people, um, you know, change the way they think and, and help people add value to, to other people. That's excellent. That's excellent. Um, hey, um, the Millionaire Mastermind, uh, you like you mentioned, is a, is a monthly program that you offer to women CEOs. Um, are you still offering that during the, the down, you know, the quarantines or shutdowns? And uh, what is your strategy and how can somebody get involved in the Millionaire Mastermind? Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I am. So we're actually um, mentoring once a month, the third Monday, I'm sorry, the third, the third Thursday of every month. And we are kind of changing the format um, of things. And we just actually had a live Zoom um, meeting. And so the, the, the website is millionairemastermindacademy.org. And I am on, you know, on all social media platforms, Velma, I'm on Instagram, which is Velma underscore Traham, of course, LinkedIn, Facebook. And so um, I'm always, my team is always sending out information. Um, so right now we are kind of changing some things up, but we are still, um, you know, working diligently and passionately to help women um, start businesses, um, especially right now with so many people that are that are that are out of that are out of jobs. I believe that entrepreneurship is key right now. I believe that it's it's really really important that you know that we really really take this time to build, to take this time to become owners, business owners, owning our ideas, owning land, owning creativity, owning the business. So I'm excited for. Um, this pivot, and I'm excited to uh, be able to help and to help more women to really, really walk in their purpose through entrepreneurship. Oh, I love it. You know, I, I have a passion, obviously, to help uh, Christian CEOs hear the words well done. And, and you know, mm -hmm. part of that, as you mentioned earlier, is, you know, helping people to discover the gifts and the talents and the vision that God has for their life. I believe Ephesians 2.10 that says we're God's workmanship we've been created to do good works that he's prepared in advance. Amen. And I think there's a lot of uh, people that are called to, to be business owners and to grow influence, to help communities and help poverty, like you said, and help Amen. families. I mean, that's one of the greatest Amen. opportunities that we have today. And so many people sometimes are afraid to walk in that giftedness and talent. Hey, real quick, as we finish up, I know you have a, a vision to, to help remove poverty in America. And you, you're doing that through helping uh, uh, women specifically become business owners and CEOs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that passion? I just love to hear about why you're so passionate about removing poverty. And, and obviously we see this as a, a big issue in America. Yeah, um, so for me, um, you know, I was, I was, I was raised, you know, very, very humble beginnings um, in, you know, extreme poverty. And I, I, you know, I would always say, God, if, if, if you allow me out, I promise I would give back and I would help as many other people as I can. Mm -hmm. And that has always followed me that. So it's in my heart and it's in my spirit because um, poverty is a state of mind. And when you truly can change the way you think, then everything else will come into fruition. And so what happens is the enemy, the enemy's job is to steal, kill, and destroy. So a lot of women never really tap into their full potential 
because they don't think that they can. They don't think that, you know, they have what it takes because oftentimes, uh, you know, working in corporate, and I know this from, you know, consulting a lot of women that have worked in corporate. Me personally, I've only had two jobs in my whole life. I worked for Google for nine months. I was 21 years old. And then I worked for a segregation firm for a year and a half. Those were my only two jobs. So I don't really know the corporate structure, but now being a consultant for corporations, I, I, I hear a lot of, of what the, you know, the women tell me and share with me that, you know, co co corporate can, can, can really, really put you like in a, as a piece of a puzzle. And then you don't know, you know, you, you never really find your true identity. So for me, I just became really passionate about it, especially after hearing, you know, a lot of those stories and, and, and knowing, you know, how, you know, people would say, Belma, you're so bold. How are you able to, and I'm saying to myself, how am I bold? What, what, is, what exactly does that mean? And then when I see what they go through compared to me just had, saying, hey, you know, I'm going to just leave my home, my hometown, Houston, Texas, and just start all over. You know, that's a bold, that's a bold move. But you have to be bold. You have to step out in faith. And so I, I just want to encourage women that, hey, look, if I can do it, you certainly can do it. You know, if I can do it and I don't have a corporate structure, corporate background, well, now I do because even like right now, Grady is the fifth largest, Grady is the fifth largest healthcare system in the United States. And they're my corporate mentor. Um, Grady is, is Thinkzilla's corporate mentor. So now being able to um, walk in a space that I have not, partaken in has really really allowed me to to see and, and to gain a deeper passion for helping women i liked your comment about uh, poverty being a mindset and you know i think there is the power of the mind that we can um all of a sudden when we begin i i, I back to that concept that we were talking about believe and ask for the impossible i say in the in the book that many people accomplish the impossible when somebody believes it's possible right so wow. you know the power to speak into other people's lives and and i had that when i was uh, i came from uh, a, a poverty type of situation in the midwest wow. somebody told me at one point hey you could go to college hey you could you can you could leave this the, you could leave this city there's something that god might have for you that that and that was one voice out of a multitude of voices that told me no, that nobody in our, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Nobody in my family had ever left that city. You know, ever, we you know just repeated it over and over and over again. And I mean, I love my family. I love where I came from. I love everything about that. But somebody believed something different for me. And when somebody spoke that into my life, somebody who believed what was impossible, somebody believed it was possible. And I just think that that's so powerful. That that's a message that, and we do that, we can do that in communities, we can do that through our employees, we can do that through our efforts, we can use that through our giftedness. And so, Velma, you, I am a big fan of what you are doing for, um, in your company. I love what you do for women uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs. I love what you're doing and helping them start businesses and make an impact in their communities, not only all over the country, but all over the world. And Amen. so I'm just delighted that we're friends. I'm delighted that we're uh, that we're peers. I love uh, what you're doing, uh, the awkward genius of what you're doing. I think that's that's uh, fantastic. And of course, you know your book, uh, When God Says Go. Boy, how powerful that is that as well. So hey, thank you for being here today. I look forward to connecting with you in the future, and we can uh, be talking some more ways that we can partner together. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited. And I'm, I'm a call away. Just reach out. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys for attending today. I appreciate it.